Uh, my name is Laura Lansky. I'm an attorney at Michael Bus. Um, I mostly focus on copyright, trademark, brand protection, advertising, and media, those kind of issues. Um, and we're from a full range of clients from startups to you know, big Fortune 500 companies, all of those kind of brand protection, copyright problems. Um, it's my colleague, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Peterson. I'm a partner at Michael Best. I uh, chair our Licensing and technology transactions practice, but I'm also a patent attorney in the Northern Biology field. We do a lot in the IT and the computer space as well. Um, so I primarily work on assisting companies and universities and startups licensing technology out of universities with, with setting up their licensing arrangements um, as well as at prosecution center. Um, so today we'll be speaking specifically about copyright licensing. I'll talk a little bit about how that can overplay with, with patent licensing and some other licenses uh, as you're bringing out a holistic view uh, of technology. So Laura's going to get started about first kind of getting into some of the copyright basics. And the second half of the presentation, I'll be talking about uh, copyright licensing uh, in particular. So uh, with that, I'll Great. hand it back over to Laura. Yeah, so first we'll just talk over intro to copyright. So, you know, obviously the first question is what is a copyright? Um, so copyrights are a form of intellectual property and they can be granted for protection for certain works that are original works of authorship. So these things on the screen, literary works, novels, plays, that sort of thing, musical works, songs, uh, dramatic works, plays, and musicals, uh, pantomimes and choreographic works, so a ballet, for instance, uh, pictorial, graphic, and sculpture works, that's all the visual arts, uh, and then motion pictures and other audiovisual works, so, you know, a movie or like a music video or a YouTube video, right? And then sound recording, so the actual, uh, not just the composition of the music, but the sound recording of that composition can also be uh, protected. Just to jump in here, this is kind of out of the copyright statute. You notice software isn't on the list. This is not in the statute. But software code is a copyrightable subject. Yes. So it's under the, the big umbrella of literary works. They consider that to be uh, you know, a, a written work. Um, and so these works of authorship are eligible for copyright protection so long as they are reduced to a fixed, tangible medium. So what that means is you actually have to write it down you have to record the song um, or make the uh, movie or create the novel. You actually have to do that uh, part of it and create it to a, a fixed tangible medium. So the idea of something is not operatable. You actually have to reduce it to that fixed medium. So um, like I mentioned, there are things that aren't operatable, first of which is ideas, right? So if you have an idea for the next great American novel, Right? That idea is not protected. It's only protected once you actually create the novel itself. Uh, also not protectable would be discoveries, formulas, or inventions. Now, we're talking about copyrights here, so these things could be protected under patents, for instance. Um, titles, names, short phrases, or slogans, that falls under the realm of trademark law, as opposed to copyright. Uh, useful articles, so things you know, that are really have a cultural purpose, you know, goes back to more of a padded land. Um, and then listing of ingredients or contents, so like a recipe, for instance, uh, that's not going to rise the level of protectable under copyright law. And then anything that really lacks a modicum of creativity. And that's really a broad phrase, but it's it's basically you just have to have like enough creativity, it doesn't have to be the most amazing, you know, copyright or work ever, but it has to have enough creativity to warrant uh, the copyright protection. So how are copyrights actually acquired? How do you get a copyright? Um, so copyright protection is actually automatic. Um, so as soon as you are actually creating that work, you're fixing it in the tangible uh, form, uh, you automatically have protection. There's an old sort of um, like adage or slogan that says, 
as soon as my pen lifts from the paper, I have it. Um, so it doesn't need to be published uh, to be copyrightable. Uh, it also does not have to have uh, a copyright notice that sort of see the year and your name. So it doesn't need that for it to be protected. Um, and you don't have to register at the copyright office, but there are a lot of benefits uh, to registration. So the benefits of registration is that it provides you with a public record of your claim. It's you telling the world, you're putting the world on notice that I own this particular work and I own the rights in it. Um, it's, <coughs> it's necessary in order for you to bring a, a copyright infringement lawsuit. So if there's a scenario where you're going to want to stop somebody else from unauthorized, uh, unauthorized use of your work, you're going to need that, that registration to shore up your, your litigation claims. Um, and if you register it within three months of publication, there's some extra like benefits that you get. So there's some, you know, there's some uh, positives to getting that application in sooner rather than later. Uh, and the benefit mostly comes in that litigation scenario where you're trying to enforce your rights against another party. It allows you to have some additional options for damages mostly statutory damages, which are basically statute um, uh, prescribed damages so that you don't have to prove up how much they owe you, which in litigation can be a really big win. Um, so that's some benefits. It's not required to register it, but it's recommended if you, if you think it's an important work. So, so when you think through, you know, I have all this, these copyrightable, you know, uh, work, I own all these things that I created, should I or should I not register it? You really have to sort of walk through some of these um, these questions. You know, first, are you planning to license it? Are you going to have you know somebody else who will work on it with you? Are you going to license it out to them for them to do whatever they want to do? Um, are you worried about somebody infringing it, using it without your permission? Um, and you also want to consider like how long do you think this copyright is going to be? useful to you? How long does this work you know, actually to be important to you? Will it matter in a few months or a year? You know, there's lots of things, there's a lot of things that we create that you know, are technically protectable by copyright, but may or may not actually have the life to, um, to want to you know, protect via registration. Um, and how much resources are you putting into? Is there a lot of time and money and energy put into it or not, right? So these are some things you can kind of weigh. Uh, and of course, you can register the work at any time, but there are no special benefits if you register it in three months of publishing it, or, you know, making it available to the public. So how do you actually uh, make the registration? Well, um, I know the UW uh, MRF has some resources for helping you register it, but it's a pretty simple online. Um, the Copyright Office has a fee of $65 per work that you want to register. Um, and the, the trickier thing is you have to provide a copy of the work to the Copyright Office. It goes to the Library of Congress, it goes to DC, um, and they need that in order to finish off the application and, and approve it for registration. And sometimes people forget to do that because it's a secondary issue, but it's very important to complete your application. Um, if it's electronic, you just immediately upload it to the Copyright Office, that's easy. But if it's a physical thing, like a book, for instance, uh, you actually have to mail two different copies uh, into the Copyright Office to DC. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward process, and it takes about three to six months for it to go from start to finish. So how long do you actually have the right to the copyright? Do it last forever? No. So for works created after 1978, the copyright protection lasts only. Let me move you down. There we go. It, it lasts for the life of the author plus 70 uh, years. So for as long as you're alive plus an additional 70 years, you and your heirs could benefit from it. Um, so that's important to note. For anonymous work, for pseudonymous work, and work for hire, which we'll get to in a moment, it's a little different in that it's the 95 years from the year of first publication or um, 120 years from the year it was uh, created, whichever expires first. So it's a little different, but 
point is, it's a long time. So thinking through how you want to manage your portfolio of copyrights uh, can be really important, especially if there is, you know, monetization happening or some sort of property happening. You want to make sure you plan for the long term for it. So you might have heard of the phrase, but no, it's in the public domain, you use it. The public domain is any work that's not protected by copyright, um, it's all considered in the public domain. And it usually is either work that has never been copyright protectable, it just didn't qualify, um, or it's, it has some sort of expiration, and now like, the, the protection has expired, and now it's in the public domain. Um, so it's, uh, and just to note, most works created by the US government, they're going to be in the public domain. Um, and so any works that are in public domain are free to use. And because of some shifts of how the law and the statutes were written, uh, there's a public domain date. So if you Google like public domain date, uh, it changes every year as time marches on. But as of 2023, January 1st of 2023, anything in 1927 or before is going to be in the public domain because of how the statute um, it was written and how uh, those works have expired. Um, so yeah, so next year it'll be 1928. You can usually track that, by the way, when you see new entertainment come out, like the Winnie the Pooh War movie. You can tell it's not in the public domain, or at least certain aspects of it. Or there was a wealth of Sherlock Holmes and TV shows and movies a number of years ago that coincided with the earliest um, uh, literary work kind of went off copyrights, so and then everyone's kind of free to kind of go out and do that without I think Great Gatsby was like, yeah. one of the most recent ones that was a big, you know, big deal. So, so uh, I also briefly mentioned that you are not required to use a copyright notice, but it's really nice to have. So copyright notices just consist of this example here, uh, the circle C, um, or you can say copyright if you wanted, and then uh, the year and the date of um, first publication, uh, and then whoever is the owner. So in this scenario, it's, you know, Jane Doe published this work in 2023. Um, it's totally optional, you don't have to do it, but it, like registration, there are benefits to doing it. It puts the public on notice that you consider it to be protected under copyright, and that they should contact you for permission to use it. Um, you know, it's, it's good to have, it's not required. I know a lot of times people don't want to put, you know, copyright notice on everything, but especially the things that are of work to you, that you spend a lot of time on, it's certainly worth the quick flicker of including that. So we talked a lot about what is a copyright and should you register and the benefits of that, but you might be considering, you know, what exactly do you get to do with a copyright? So you basically have these four rights uh, once you own a copyright the right to reproduce it, your exclusive right to make copies of it, the um, right to uh, distribute it, those kind of hand in hand, uh, and then the right to display and publicly perform the work. And then this middle one here, the creation of derivative works, that's where you're allowed, you're the exclusive owner of the copyrights, so you're allowed to be the exclusive owner of any derivative works, any transformed or recast works of the original creation that you made. So a good example is a translation. You know, if you uh, created a, a novel and you wanted to um, translate it, you should be the exclusive owner of that translation. Another good example is Harry Potter. You have a novel and then you go and make a movie of Harry Potter. That's a transformation. It's a recast of the original book. So J.K. Rowling had to give out the rights in order for Harry Potter book, you know, number one, to be made into a movie. Um, so that just gives you some examples of, you know, what it is that you're allowed to do. And if you have to, you can enforce with registration against someone else who makes, you know, use of these four, um, four rights without your permission. So like I mentioned with derivative works, here's some good examples of you know, works that are based off of a pre-existing work that could then uh, be a derivative work. Um, but really it comes down to, is it is it recast, is it transformed, is it adapted? Those are all kind of words that if you're describing that, you're probably talking about a derivative work of the original work. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so when you're contemplating if you have a derivative work, it really becomes a fact specific analysis. You have to sort of you know, dig into, well, how much do they take? Is it, is it really transformed? Is it really recast? There's a lot of sort of thought process that goes into it. And different jurisdictions uh, have different rules on it um, and have different case law that um, you know, are handling of that, of that issue. Um, and it also, there's a, there's a common thread though of, is there some sort of su substantial amount of material from that original work? Um, and that they're really incorporating the underlying work as an expression of that, as opposed to just an idea. So the, the concept of you know, Harry Potter, the book, being changed into a movie, you know, they're taking basically everything from that book and putting it on the screen. Contrast that with, if I'm a movie studio and I realize Harry Potter's really popular and I want to go and do teenagers, you know, or with witches and wizards, that's a totally different thing than if I'm taking Harry Potter and the story and Hogwarts and all the specifics from uh, J.K. Rowling's book, right? So there's sort of an, uh, you know, an analysis that goes on as to how close is it to that underlying work. Um, so that's when you would have it as really important. It's really transforming and recasting it from the original work. It's more complex than the scene, especially if you get into things like, well, I'm creating a new code. Is this software a derivative of the code that came before? And it, it's as Laura said, a different federal court jurisdictions have different tests that they apply if you're looking at whether it's a derivative or not. So it's a very fact specific analysis. It's about our own. So if you're if you're starting with a pre-existing work or you're starting with pre-existing code and you're doing something to it, you're wondering, hey, why did the license to make this derivative work? Or will I own this because it's considered a broken work that I'm going to own? You really kind of have to you know, work with somebody who works in this area of the law and, and get some analysis done if that's a critical factor to your, your business or your startup, either something that you want to license to somebody else or you want to take a license to. This is a very fact specific issue if it's some sort of modification of the existing work that you, you have to spend some time doing an analysis on. Um, and so to that, you know, question, can you have a separate copyright in a derivative work? Yes. So the copyright of the underlying work would still be preserved by the original um, per, uh, person, but the derivative work would have its own copyright in and of itself. Um, and really, it does not not it does not grant exclusive right in the pre-existing material, uh, but you do have that right in that, in that derivative work. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about sort of the area of copyright, but we haven't talked that much about when you create something, who actually owns it. And that can be a really complicated issue to parse through, especially when you're working on a team or you're working with your employer. It can, it can be multifaceted. So generally speaking, it's like a rule of thumb, initially at least, copyrights are owned by the author of the work that's being created. So whoever actually created it, you wrote the novel, you wrote the song, Whoever that person is, is the owner. Um, but uh, if there's more than one author, then the authors uh, together can be considered co-owners of the copyright, and they're known as joint authors. Um, so there are a couple of exceptions to that general rule. You make it, you own it. And that, the big one is going to be the work made for hire doctrine. So you've probably heard that phrase before. Uh, basically, work made for hire comes down uh, to two very specific categories, and if those categories apply, then the employer or the person who commissioned the work is the person who's going to own it. So those two very specific categories are, one, it's prepared by an employee within the scope of their employment, um, and what that can be, that can be a whole bunch of litigation on just that subject, but it, in essence, let's say you, know, you work in like an advertising agency, and your, your job is to create the workplace. So because you were hired and the scope of your employment is to create this artistic work, the commercial, then that is um, the copyright that's owned by your employer, the advertising agency. Um, versus, let's say you're like a receptionist, right? So your job is to do like, you know, you know the phone call and study in the conference rooms and do calendars, like your job is not to create sort of the commercials of the advertising agency. So there are arguments there that if that person 
sort of helping out with the um, with the uh, commercials or had some great idea that you know tweeted in something that they helped on. There's an argument that that's not really within the scope of their employment, right? So that's sort of a, a catch-all, but it's important to really look at it and make sure that it makes sense for the particular you know, facts. The second category is way more specific. Uh, it's when you're specifically ordering or commissioning a work made for hire, and you put that in writing, agreement, um, as a contribution to one of these things, which, you know, honestly, they don't come up that often. Um, but the big ones are probably motion picture, translations, uh, those sort of things. Um, but if they don't fall in that category, then it doesn't count as work made for hire unless you're an employee. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people throw away or throw out the work made for hire um, definition and they sort of just say, oh, it's work made for hire. But really, when it comes down to it, there's like two categories of what actually applies. So, if the creator has sold the entire copyright, or maybe they're purchasing a business or, you know, somehow they're transferring it, that owner can shift. Um, but without that, this work made for hire doctrine is, is these very two specific scenarios. And for an, entrepreneur, for an entrepreneurial venture, it's important to kind of remember this specific one. Because, again, this is kind of what the statute says where ownership starts. And so oftentimes, if you are bringing in somebody to work with your new venture, and say, I'm going to have somebody draft this, I'm going to work with an owner, they're going to do software for it. Well, if they're not an employee and you're hiring them to do software, they're going to own that. So you better have a contract with them that says, I agree, I'm going to assign my copyrights to you. Because it's not going to invest with you originally. If it was an employee, they would never own it. You would own it as the employer from the get-go under the work made for hire. But you can't agree that the software, for instance, you agree that the software is work made for hire because it doesn't fall within one of those very specific categories, which means it's not a work made for hire, it's an assignment. They own it, they agree to assign it over. And so when you're working with partnering on anybody, you know, unless it's basically it's less that you are an employee that, that's part of their employment responsibilities, the presumption should be if I'm working with another party, they're going to own it. Do I have a contractual arrangement with them that identifies clearly, that, you know, are they going to own it and give me rights? Am I going to own it? How is that going to work? The sheer fact that you pay somebody to do something for you, to create a work for you, does not mean you own it. I mean, the, those of us of a certain age, you ever got married and hired a wedding photographer? You come to surprise that I actually don't own the copyrights in my own wedding photos. The photographer owns the copyright, right? So if I want pictures, I gotta go back to the wedding photographer and buy the prints. Because even though I paid them a ridiculous amount of money to take these wedding photos, I don't actually own the copyrights in my own wedding photos. And so things of that nature, just remember when you're collaborating with a lot of new business, that, you know, entrepreneurial ventures, that's what they do. They, they don't necessarily have employees, but I'm working with this person who's helping me out with my website, who's helping me out with this. Have those agreements in place to make sure that you own it, because it's probably not going to fit within one of these uh, work for hire categories. The other time this comes up in sort of startup scenarios is where you own the LLC, you're a manager of the LLC or a member of the LLC, but you're you're technically not an employee, right? You're an owner of the business. So that's another scenario where you're creating something for your LLC. You'll want something that transfers what you're doing to the LLC so it's all housed in your business entity. Because uh, technically, as the owner, you're not an employee. Can I just say, like, patents too, be careful, because I've seen startups where they're LLCs and they have no agreement in place that the company owns an invention as well. And then we've gotten into some mix ups, I'm yeah. <laughs> sure, where. An employee started had bad relations with the co-founder and wanted to run off with the event. The other thing that's important, important, this is for copyrights. And of course, because the US legal system likes to make things complex, inventorship rights under patent are different than author ownership rights under copyrights. So let's say I created a new piece of software that's patentable. Well, my employer may own it if I was hired as an employee, they may own the copyright to own it. But unless I had another contractual arrangement with them, I, as the inventor, if I invented the subject matter that we're patenting, 
I would still own that even though they own the code unless I have an agreement that says that my employer owns all the IP that I create. So normally you see these agreements. I own, you will, I the employer own all the intellectual property you create, patent rights, the copyrights, everything. And it's all signed over. But it, they are two completely separate legal analysis as to ownership, patent, and copyright. Yes. So <clears throat> if copyright is automatic, what is the benefit of registering a copyright? Oh, oh, I'm glad you asked. So the benefit of registering is that it's the big the big thing is it's necessary to bring an infringement lawsuit. So if you want to stop somebody else from using it without your permission, you're gonna need that registration to go after them, send them a cease and desist letter, bring them into a courtroom, you know, to sue them. So you actually don't have exclusive rights to copy it automatically because you wouldn't be able to do anything about it unless you register. Yeah, you register retroactively though. Yeah. You can. You would, yeah, you can do it at any time. You just would have to do it before you file the suit. Now, registering does have an effect on damage calculations when you register. Because if you register right away and they take certain actions, you can say, well, my registration was placed on this day, certain statutory uh, damages would apply after your registration. If you register it retroactively, you may not be able to reach back and get certain damage. If you get an injunction, you can stop from doing it. But the, 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 the range of damages in play, the timing when you get your registration matters. For the vast majority of these people don't register all their websites and everything else, or you know, just because, it, like you said, every time you create something, you generate a copy. Everybody's not registering everything that they do. If it's a published manuscript, if it's certain types of software, then you'll see more registrations where you may want to go out and enforce it. But you can, unlike a patent where you have to do certain things early in the process, or you can't patent it because it's, you kind of let that, those deadlines go, you can't go back and patent it. You can register your copyright at any time. So, um, so when, and then just briefly on joint authorship, if you're collaborating with somebody else, and if you have you, know, you, somebody else, or more people with the intent to combine your contributions into one inseparable thing, um, then that's considered a joint work, and the authors are considered to be joint authors. And um, that means that each, unless you have an agreement otherwise, each of those individual people can go out and use and exploit the work as they see fit, um, but they just have to account to the other parties, um, you know, for profit. So, like, you know, if there's me and somebody else working on something together, and then I go off and sell it to someone, I would have to account to them and provide them with half of the profits. Uh, and that's under the statute. But we can override that if me and the other person have an agreement together that says, okay, it's actually really my idea, so I get 70%. Or whatever the situation is, but unless you have that agreement, otherwise, you know that person's free to go off and do whatever they want. So the rights of copyrighted works can be transferred from whoever created it or whoever the owner is to someone else. Um, it just has to be in writing. Uh, so, for instance, you could uh, you could assign the copyrights to the EWM or up. Um, so just very briefly, and so on, on software issues, and Jeff, feel free to chime in on this, but software that's created by faculty or employees, if it's in the scope of their employment, uh, typically those copyrights are owned by the university, but patent rights would need to be transferred via a contractual agreement. Yeah, I believe it's in your, like, sort of your, your faculty. Yeah, you know, Elam is, um, Generally, it's owned by the author, unless there were substantial contribution from the okay. university. So it's a little, uh, and we're different to it, you know, you know, at Wisconsin system, with owning inventions is not automatic, unless X, Y, and Z, like unless yeah. there was a grant. Or but for copyright, it's more rare, I think, that we automatically own it, unless there was a grant from the university given us the degree. Yes, yeah, so that, that fits into this. So like a lot of times the university will own it if it's created within the scope of their employment, um, it's maybe created on university time with university facilities and resources and money, that sort of thing. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's commissioned by the university, maybe not. Um, 
And so here, that's when a scenario, and also if there's federal funds involved, uh, where the university might own it. Um, in contrast, well, uh, and just as a quick side there, and we won't get an ownership, but and this is just what goes with patents. Under patents, if there's federal money involved, there's a federal statute called Bayou that relates to what the government's rights are in any sort of patentable technology that comes out of that funding. Under most federal funding grant, there's, and under the FAR provisions for federal funding, there's ancillary rules on what happens to the data the copyrights, what rights to the government have. So if you take federal money, even if it's say an SBIR grant, and where you're taking money to do work with your startup, the government's going to have potentially certain rights in the patentable things that come out of it. They will also have certain rights to use, essentially, the copyrighted material, the data, doing certain things. So what the context of that is kind of varies from project to project. But just to always be in mind, this is great, I own the copyright in this, that's fine. But once you have federal money involved, the government's going to have some rights in that too. And you should understand what those rights are going to be. So um, in contrast, uh, Santa Paula said that dictated an employee-owned uh, IP is, if it's unrelated to the employee's job, you know, that's sort of self-perfectionist example I used earlier. Uh, and the employee made no more than incidental use of the university's resources. Uh, if, the, um, if it is an inventor that has been released to the inventor of the university, uh, if the researcher or student authored a scholarly, educational, like course materials, artistic, musical, literary, or other sort of architectural work, in that offers field of expertise, that's some sort of scholarly work. Um, even though that work may be within the scope of, of employment, and even if university resources were used, um, it, it, it's unless it's actually created by someone who was specifically hired to create it uh, or commissioned by the university, then it would still be owned by the employee. So, you know, as you can see from these past few slides, the ownership discussion is definitely one that's worth pausing and reviewing and analyzing because it can get uh, pretty complicated depending on the facts. So, you know, we briefly touched on this, but um, what is copyright infringement? Infringement occurs when that those four buckets of, of rights are violated. Somebody is using the work without your permission. Um, and usually that's proved by evidence of actual copying, catch them in the act. Or more commonly, you have evidence of access. So we've had access to your work. It's available online, they saw it, whatever. Um, and it's substantially similar to what they created. Um, so, you know, briefly we touched on this, but uh, for remedies, so things that you could get out of um, the copyright infringement, it has to be registered with the Copyright Office first and foremost, but you can get actual damages, so anything, you know, monetary damages, uh, plus profits of the infringer, uh, the statutory damages, which we touched on, uh, can be very high, uh, as you can see, it can go up to 150000 um, and you can also get your costs and attorney's fees to go through the litigation process. You might be able to get destruction of the infringing materials. Um, and in a sort of large scale piracy issue, it could actually be a criminal uh, liability for the other party. So, yeah, the one thing that's not on there is your equitable remedies, which would be an injunction. Yeah, to have them stop use. That's right. Have them stop, that stop yeah. the infringing use. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, one of the last few topics I'm going to talk about before, before I pass it off to Jeff is fair use. There's, there's always a lot of sort of discussion, especially in the academic world, of fair use. Um, but just for a definition, it's transformative uses that repurpose no more of the work that is needed to make the point or achieve the purpose. That's generally fair use. And it falls under, um, or excuse me, it, it, there's only these four factors that you have to analyze if you're considering whether or not a situation is fair use. So a lot of times people think, oh, I'm in an academic institution, I could just use it, it's fair use. That's really not right. <laughs> it's actually a very narrow set of you know, things to consider. And those are these four factors. Uh, the first is the purpose and character of the use. So this is your, um, I'm using it for an academic purpose versus a commercial purpose. So in that scenario, you fall on one side or the other uh, pretty easily. Number two is the nature of the copyrighted work. So this is sort of how creative is it, how unique is it, how um, how complicated is it to recreate that. Um, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. So 
if you, you know, going back to Harry Potter example, one line from Harry Potter is a small amount, right? One sentence from Harry Potter, small amount. The entire novel, that's the whole thing, right? So that's what that gets at. And then the last is the effect of the use upon the potential market. So if you're, what you're going to, uh, proposing to do, if that would make it more difficult for the original owner to make money off of it, that you're kind of stealing some of their ability to profit, that would be a problem. So these four factors uh, really indicate that it's a pretty narrow subsection of things. Per, like anecdotally, personally, every time a fair use question comes in to like buy door, 99.9% of the time, it's not a fair use. And people always sort of think it is, but when you start walking through these four factors, it really is really narrow. And then you still, I mean, the Warhol case was just, what, this past year? Yeah. I mean, these, these issues are still getting they get you know, addressed, you know, on a, on a regular basis by people you think would know better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. So question, um, I have to give these slides sometimes. And I had a faculty member say, oh, well, you can use 11%. Like, I have found nothing yeah. regarding that. That's, that's, that's not true. That's not true, right? No. Yeah, that's and not real. Well, yeah. I can say, like, oh, 30 seconds of a song. No, that's not. Like, yeah. that, they think that they're trying to get to the amount of substantiality. Like, oh, it's only a teeny bit. It's a diminuous amount. That's not like a real thing. It's a um, factor, but it's not. You have to look at it in context yeah, of all the other factors. Yeah. Well, I like believed, and then I looked it up, and I couldn't find anything about the percentage. So I'll have to make sure to let. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that leads me perfectly into copyright permits. So um, you know, there's a number of things like that that are out there in the world that people just assume. You know, like oh, it's online. I can use it. That's not true. Somebody created that, somebody's the owner of it. Um, works without any copyright notice can be copied. Like, if they're not saying it's copyrightable, well, then I'm not going to worry about it. That's also a myth, you still should worry about it. Um, you can use the work if you make some changes to it. That goes back to our derivative work conversation, you're transforming their work, which is their uh, you know, exclusive right. Um, giving attribution or credit is sufficient to limit your liability. It's not true, uh, and we're uh, we're just making a small number of copies. It's just a few, also not true. Uh, and then again, like you mentioned, oh, it's for academic use, so it's okay. Nope. Again, that fair use is a really narrow um, analysis. Um, so, and then just briefly to touch on it, so what we talked about today is for copyright in the U.S. Every other country has other thoughts on copyright, different laws, different customs that they use. Um, so we do have, in the US, agreements in place with most sort of major countries uh, that we, the US, just do business with. And so most of them, they'll honor you know, the copyrights that were um, protected in the, in the US. But you know, it's obviously sort of a case-by-case -case basis. So if you are creating something that you know is going to be important, in like all Spanish speaking countries or something, you'll want to like dig into that analysis to see if there's things you need to do to protect your rights in those local countries. Um, yeah. Uh, one last thing, which I'll just raise briefly on, on some of the stuff uh, Laura was talking about, and it's still in flux because it's uh, it's cutting edge of the laws, and it's still working on it. Is ownership of AI generated content, which I'm sure you've heard about. Which, as of right now, is not copyrightable. It was created by ChatGPT, wrote up a document for you. That is a non copyrightable work. You don't own that because you asked ChatGPT to type you up a paper or type or similar with, with image generating AI. You know, do me an image that does that. Because it's not created by a human being, the stance of the Copyright Office and the US legal system as of today is that's not copyrightable. Will that be subject to change by legislative, you know, fiat over the next few years? My guess is probably we're going to see something that's going to clarify what it stands today. But as of right now, if you start incorporating, I'm going to put together a textbook or some material, I'm going to use ChatGPT to help generate a chapter or something like that. You may have material in your work that's not copyrightable because you didn't write it, a human being did not write it. So it's kind of an ownership of zero. If it's created by uh, by AI at the moment, so something to keep in mind if you're going to have AI create works that you want to use. The nice thing is it may be free to use. 
Um, but you know that's that's problematic. Also, if you are feeding somebody else's copyrighted material into an AI system, that could be a violation because you don't have the rights to use that copyrighted material and dump it into a, to an AI to create new material that the AI has to create at a sort of the data center, the learning center. So just be very wary unless you're using your own stuff as the input. And also you don't know there's a lot of liability for some of the AI pieces right now because they are bringing in material from all these other learning sets to spit out the content. What if they bring in copyright material? And maybe some liability on the AI's front. So if you're creating AI, and I'm going to use all these public databases as data sets to train my AI, you may be running into copyright problems. If you yourself, your technology is the AI technology. That's a very, very short summary of all the issues related to AI and copyright. So I could talk the whole hour just about that. Um, but GPT, like I know there's been a lot of schools giving talks on it and warning their faculty and students, like, is it not private? Like, I'm hearing different things, like, you know, yeah. is it private? Like, if you don't want to put something that's an invention in there if it's not patented because it... It is a public, if you use chat GPT, yeah. it is a public disclosure okay. because there's no patent. So if you want to have chat GPT, do a first draft of your patent application. You just now had a public disclosure. I've had someone read it, and I'm like, no, no, no. no you, that's, a public, that's a public disclosure. Whatever you put in there is non-confidential. So that's problematic if you share information. And even, not necessarily, even if you have sort of a private account with chat, GPT, or some of these things, that may or may not be a public disclosure based on how that AI engine is using it and Collaborating and storing data to roll yeah. other things. Again, something we could spend a lot of time talking about. The, the baseline to protect yourself is don't consider it confidential. But what about, well, I, we can talk about this another time, but since then the other question came up was like, well, what about when you type stuff into Google? <laughs> like, you know, they like, track everything you do. So, like, if you're yeah. doing a search for your patentable idea, yeah. and you're trying to figure out, usually like, from, a, from a patentable arrangement, Usually that doesn't arrange to <laughs> disclosing and then storing your entire thing in aggregate on the entire, they, they store it differently yeah. than that. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's potentially problematic, but not, you're, you're not going to lose inventorship over that from a patent standpoint. If you, if you put in your whole paper to have them generate a patent application, yeah, that's public disclosure. Um, so we talked a little bit about copyright licensing. Well, really, I'll talk really fundamentally in front of, well, what is a license? License is some sort of permission for somebody to do some of the rights that I have under the legal right that I'm giving it to. So as Laura talked, well, what do you have in copyright? I can prevent others from distributing it, copying it, create derivative works, you know, all the lists of the rights that you get with a copyright. A license is simply giving somebody else permission to undertake those rights that you have a restriction to. Patents would be the same thing, all the rights that I can do with a patent, I can license them. So that's really what a license. Generally, it can be oral if you really want it to be, but most of the time it's by way of a written contract, where you're either the licensor, you are granting permission, or you're the licensee, you are receiving permission to do something with a work. And in this context, we'll be talking about copyrightable works. So in any sort of a license, one of the things you want to do is really identify exactly what is the work to be licensed and be specific about it. So if I'm licensing a book, is it version one of the book? Am I, am I giving somebody the right to make their own revisions or their own additions? What exactly am I licensing? So as you put together, consider really what's the work I'm licensing. Also, again, this is a copyright. We're talking about it for software, for instance. It'd be the code in the software. Well, are there other intellectual property rights in the work that I am licensing? So if I'm licensing a piece of software, I may own the rights to the code, and lo and behold, I may have a patent on the software and how it works. Well, if I'm the licensee, I may need the rights both to the code and the rights to the patent if I want to practice it. So you need to not only understand what work is being licensed, but what other related copyrights are involved with this. Is there potentially a trademark or a trade secret or a know-how? Like uh, Laura said earlier, generally speaking, 
things like recipes, formulations, aren't copyrighted. Well, maybe I need to know the formulation. So I may need a copyright license or something that is copyrightable. But you also have to let me know the formulation. That may be a trade secret. I need a license to the trade secret. So think about holistically, even if you're a licensor or the licensee, what are all the rights around the license work that I've identified? Next, you have to, I'm giving you a right to use it under my, under my uh, copyright. But what's the purpose? What, how, what's the scope? What can you use that license work for? Can you use it for your business alone? I mean, I'm not giving you a license to go off and sell my software to other people. I'm giving you a license for you to use my software. Maybe it's, I give you a license to use my software on 15 computers, but not other computers. You know, it's the scope of the, of the license that you're giving. Maybe it's to publish and distribute license work. No, I want you to resell and relicense the work. Uh, you can just, maybe it's, you know, syndicated or distributing it for further publication. Maybe as we talked about, it's adapting it to a new medium. Uh, I've got the book, I'm going to give you my TV rights or my film rights or my documentary rights. Either it's based on a character or on a work. Maybe it's to create a derivative software work, which is, you know, could be what we call sort of a value add reseller. I'm going to give you a license to my software and you're going to integrate it into your platform. It's going to be a tool that's going to get plugged into Salesforce. So I still own my software. You're not going to go out and sell my software. My software is going to be another component of the existing platform. So that could be a licensed opportunity. Um, you know, is it again, allowing a copyright work in, a, in another creative work? So sort of an article in a compilation or a, a prop in a television program, or can you advertise or promote the license, you know, business or product? So I do maybe have some copyrighted content you can put on your website, for instance. Um, due diligence and rights clearance. We talked about this before, whether you have joint owners or multiple owners. Either whether you're the licensor or the licensee, you want to be thinking about, am I getting all the rights from the owner on this? So and sometimes as the licensee, you'd ask for a record warranty from your licensor. You actually own all the copyrights in this content. If I'm the licensor, do I really own all the copyrights in this content? Did my article, for instance, incorporate charts, graphs, photographs that somebody else created? Do I have the license to incorporate it and sub-license this down? Do I have a PowerPoint presentation I want to license out or a material that's got other people's music, other people's photographs? Maybe I have an open source license under a Creative Commons license or something else or an open source software license to include the code that allows me to sub-license that content down. But what is the scope of that open source license? And am I passing all the restrictions on that open source license if there's other owners downstream? So you really want to understand if, you know, if, do I own the right myself or is that right uh, work jointly owned? As Laura talked about before, you know, we may, need, we may not need permission to license it, but if we want to grant an exclusive license, we may need the joint owner's permission. And we have to think about how we're going to share any sort of revenue that I may get from this license. Um, if I've got other, again, if I've got other rights embodied in the work, whether it's an open source license from other software or a photograph or music in a, in a work or the, it's my grant, it's my recording of me singing a song, but do I have the appropriate license from the, the actual songwriter? to kind of pass that along. I mean, that's, you know, you hear, you know, it's exactly what Taylor Swift's doing. Yes, she may own the copyright in the songs that she wrote, but she didn't own the original recordings because she had a contractual agreement with her old publisher. Either. So she's re-recording all of her albums all over again so she can actually own the copyright in the new sound recordings. Yes? So when there's people that make covers of certain songs, like let's say a Taylor Swift song, do they have to go through a certain motion in order to Post on YouTube for monetary prices. I mean, technically speaking, you would, there's a, there's there's licensing agencies, ASCAP and BMI and the like, where you would get the license to perform the song. You have to get the license to go up and do that. So in and out, people do it all the time and infringe it, and no one doesn't. But again, the fact that you can do it and people are doing it. Doesn't mean it's not a copyright violation. YouTube also has some software mechanisms to read the songs, and if there's money being generated, it can be a shop to 
eventually the art is getting it. So if you sing Taylor Swift on YouTube, and you know, you should have probably gone to proper channels, if you're making money off of it, YouTube will you know, flag it and either, you know, move that money, some of the money off to the, um, you know, the, uh, the agency that's handling it for Taylor Swift. Um, so that's a way to sort of they can get back to the, and that's that's like kind of part of the contract with your YouTube contract. It's it's like it's like it's like it's there's it's a term that I mean, there's a whole, but I mean, the, the default under the law is outside of whatever you agree is a mechanism to deliver that kind of has some back end mechanisms like YouTube. If I just want to go down to the bar and you know and, and do a Taylor Swift set, I need a license to do that. Now sometimes you get that license by buying the sheet music. For the, yeah. the license comes with the sheet music. I can now do it, but that license would come, she would get her license revenue from the sale of the sheet music, for instance. Um, and again, for license, her sub license of third party works. Let's say again, I'm going to sub license my software and I've got open source code in it. I have to make sure it's a license sort that I am, uh, I am maintaining my obligations under that open source license that I agreed to. Is part of my sub license of this work down the road. So this comes up a lot with software because everybody uses open source components. You look at what are, what specific open source software do I have? Am I complying with that? Or it could even be as simple as I got in my in my PowerPoint, I put all these um, photos in, but they're all under a Creative Commons license, which essentially allows free re re reproduction and distribution of it. But some of the Creative Commons licenses do have restrictions. Maybe you can't create a derivative work with it. Maybe you can just use the exact same image over and over again. So again, you really have to keep an eye on exactly what rights are involved um, in the process. I'm going to go a little bit quickly here for time. So we're going a little bit over. Again, you want to identify all the rights, identify and make sure that you're getting the rights from all the third parties. And we could distribute these slides, by the way, for everybody that would like if they want more time to kind of go through them. Uh, you can consider recording the license in the Copyright Office execution. It's optional, but there are some benefits to that to make sure that the license is recorded. Um, similar to copyright protection outside the United States, if you want to license it outside the United States, you want to work with counsel. Different, different jurisdictions have different rights and obligations with respect to um, foreign licensing. Um, for each license grant, you really want to get into some of the very specifics of exactly not only what rights you're providing, but some of the limitations up to it. So, for instance, if I'm granting a license to a party, who are those parties? Is it that party and all their affiliates? Do they have the, I mean, is it, is it going to go to multiple parties or I know exactly, am I giving it to an individual or organization? Um, we talked a little bit about the license works. You know, talk a little about, you know, just because the copyrights involved distributing, distributing, copying, creating derivative works, that doesn't mean you have to give them all those rights. You can parse out and limit that as much as I can give you a right to use it, but not make derivative works. Or I can give you the right to use it, but you can't distribute it or you can't copy it. So you can go down to each one of these. License territory, what territory do you have these rights? Um, if you're going to be selling it, you know, what type of media and delivery platforms can you use? Um, do you have exclusive rights? This not exclusive rights. Can you assign or sub license the rights or can't you? And what type of rights I as the licensor do I want to reserve? Now here I'll kind of walk through these issues in more detail. Um, so again, for licensed parties, you want to really understand the scope of, of what you're giving it. Is it to the affiliates, distributors, third party contractors? Not just that customer, but can their end users use it? For instance, I give you a right to use my software for you to run a SaaS service by yourself. So you can't basically sub-license to other people, but you can put my code up on your service and you and your end users, people that subscribe to your uh, software platform can use it. You just can't go off and sub-license it to Microsoft. But I give you the right and your end users the right to use my code. So again, thinking down the chain of who are the parties that I'm giving rights to under this agreement is important. Uh, again, as we talk, you know, define the license work very specifically. If it's a portfolio of works, 
or if there's specific exclusions, I'm licensing you the text, but not the images or the text, but not the music. You need to spell that out specifically what you are and are not licensing. And if there's other rights they have to go off and get directly, you need to make that explicit in your contract. So for, for a very common certain things like, I'm gonna give you a plugin that you can use with Word or Outlook, but I'm not giving you a license to Microsoft Word or Outlook. You have to go off and get your own license to that, but my software will integrate and work with it. So you wanna make clear when you give them, I'm, giving you, I'm licensing you a plugin for Salesforce, or a plugin for Word or Outlook, that you are not giving them a license to what you are not giving them a license to, it's abundantly clear in the agreement, what they're getting and what they're not getting. Again, you don't have to give the full scope of the license rights. You could say, I'm gonna give you a right just to reproduce and distribute, but not a right to create derivative works or perform publicly, et cetera. And sure, usually the big one that people forget is the modification derivative work section. It just said, I give you the right to use my mark. You see that very commonly, it's just a general use. Well, use isn't something that's under the copyright statute, that's under the patent statute. There is not, a, it's not a copyright right. Copyright rights are reproduced, distributed, displayed, and created derivative works. So you should use the right language with the rights that you're getting under a copyright, which are different than patent rights, which would be sort of use, make, sell and import, that's patent language. Copyright language is different, and especially if you have an agreement that has both patent and copyrights in it. You have to keep the two separate in your mind and understanding what you're giving. Again, if you're giving modifications or derivative works, it doesn't need to be that broad of you can create any derivative work. You can say, for instance, I give you permission to create translations of my work and do others. So I'm giving you this textbook, you can't modify it, but you are allowed to create a version in German or a version in Japanese. And it's good, and, and you're allowed to do that with my mark, with my work. Um, do you want to have approval rights over the modifications or put any other limitations on the modifications? And you want to be explicit again, because derivative works can have their own ownership. If you want to own that derivative work, so I'm licensing you my textbook, you're going to go off and market it and be my publisher into all these other marks, but I'm going to own the copyright. So I may give you the right to take my textbook and translate into German. But if I don't say that, that I own the derivative work, you own the derivative work. So that you now own the German version of my textbook. So even if this license terminates, and you no longer have the, you no longer paying the royalty under my, my original agreement, you now own the, the copyright in the German textbook. You go do what you want with it. That's problematic. So you have to think through, do I, own the, do I want to own the derivative work as the licensor? For instance, um, 20th Century Fox owns the copyright in the Harry Potter movie. J.K. Rowling owns the copyright in the book. Now granted, she's got a contractual rights so she gets paid for that, but they own the copyright in the, in, in the movie. So even if her, you know, they can do what they want with their copyright in the movie, they can't create new movies without her permission, because that would be New derivative works, they get a license for that. But you know, think through the derivative work issue very, very carefully. If you're giving somebody else the right to own a derivative work or a modification, if you're the licensor. And if you're the licensee, you need to understand if I'm going to create a new version of software, software version two, am I going to own that or is my licensor going to own that? And what does that mean for my future developments of my company? Again, geographic territory, you know, where can I use this? Where can I distribute it? Spell that out in your agreement so it's clear what those geographic territories are. Again, you, this, you see this more with, uh, you know, publication agreements. If I'm giving you the right to uh, publish my educational material, is that all rights or, look, you can share it on the internet or you can, you can, you can print out a physical textbook, but I don't want you to do ebooks. I want to handle ebooks myself. So again, you can, you can, craft your license agreement, not only by work, but the media and delivery platform that's going out. You, if you're the licensee and you want to make sure you've got ultimate flexibility, you may say things like all formats and media, whether now or here and after known and devised, because I want to be your exclusive publisher. Maybe we're going to, you know, that we didn't envision that it was going to be showing up on 
you know, the metaverse or in some sort of virtual library and then go on Facebook. And we didn't envision that. That's not really an ebook. It's not really a textbook. It, but we're delivering it in some sort of virtual library. Did I just get the rights to do that as a publisher? If I just say electronically? Maybe, maybe not. So again, think about if I'm getting certain rights to do something, what are all the media rights I may need on how to deliver that? Again, it can be exclusive or non-exclusive. I, you're going to be my sole publisher. So I'm giving you the exclusive publication right to publish my text. Or are you going to be an non-exclusive licensee? So I can give it, I can do it myself, I can go to another publisher, or I can license, like most large software, if I'm a, license, a licensee of Microsoft Windows, that's a non-exclusive license. They can grant that to millions of people when they do. Or do I have a very specific piece of uh, of uh, AI software for drug discovery in the cancer field, well, I'm going to license that exclusively to Pfizer. So Pfizer, you are going to be my exclusive licensee for my cancer AI drug discovery software. I can't give it to anybody else, but you're going to pay me a premium for that because you've got the exclusive rights, and I can even carve that up by territory. You have the exclusive rights to use that in the United States. I can give that to another company in Europe. So you can really treat this as much like you can with a patent license, as a puzzle. Where do I want to give my exclusivity, non-exclusivity? I can break that up for different works. I can break that up with different rights. I can break that up in different territories. Um, and, and then think about if I am giving an exclusive license, what does that mean? Um, for instance, an exclusive licensee can sue for copyright. They may not need it. If I'm a non-exclusive licensee, I don't have the right to sue anybody else over it. Even, though, if I, even if I'm paying them a royalty, I'm like, well, this guy's using this mark, or the, this work over here, he's selling the textbook. Uh, I want to stop him from doing that. I don't think he's got a license. If you're non-exclusive, you don't have a right to sue. If you're an exclusive licensee, you may have the right to sue. Um, normally, what we would do as best practice is, if you want the rights to sue and you're a licensee, you put that explicitly in the agreement, and you always ask the licensor, and, hey, if I need you to join the lawsuit, so I have standing, I can actually file the lawsuit, you agree you're gonna join, and maybe I'll even pay your way if I call you into the suit and you don't wanna be there. Or what are the, how are we gonna split proceeds at the end if there's a successful lawsuit? There's just a lot of issues to kind of think through on that. Um, assignment and sub-licensing. Do I have the right to assign this license for a startup? This is really important. If I'm a licensee of technology, and one of my end goals is an exit event where somebody's going to buy my company. Do I have the right to have this license go to the new owner of my company? Or is that prohibited from the licensor? So think about that if you're going to, if you are the, or if you're the licensor, if I license it to a sub licensee, do I, I'm, I'm willing to give this individual a license or this company a license, but I don't want them just selling it to anybody or getting acquired by anybody where I don't know who my partner's going to be. And now I've got an agreement with somebody that I don't know or trust. I may want a contractual provision that says, you can't assign it without getting my permission. I want to know who it's going to. Um, if you're the licensor and you're going to want to say, look, I'm only going to give you the rights to use this. So you could sell the textbook in, in the United States, but I still want to be able to sell the textbook to um, drug companies myself. So we've got our own little thing here. If you are licensing somebody else certain rights, and you as the owner want to retain other rights, it's always a good idea to be explicit about what rights you're reserving for yourself. So it's abundantly clear you're not giving away rights. For instance, if I give you the rights, you are my exclusive publisher to my work in all forms of expression. I now cannot copy and distribute my own work, even as the owner. So I've given all those exclusive rights to somebody else. I can say, well, I can do it. I don't need a license. I'm the owner. Well, I just agreed by contract that somebody else is the exclusive, that the exclusive rights to publish and distribute. So if you want to own, reserve your own rights to do certain things, you need to explicitly state that in the agreement, especially if you're giving exclusivity. <clears throat> if it's a visual work of art uh, under the Copyright Act or work originating outside juris jurisdiction in the U.S., there may be moral rights protection, which is a different set of laws. It's a little bit closer to sort of attribution, which is you've got the right as the author 
to be attributed to that work. It's my photograph, it's my piece of art. Even if I agree that you own it, you can't go out there and do it without attributing it to me. And so that's a separate thing you need to be considered, which even if I have an agreement that I own it, do I still gotta put this person's name on it, associated with this work? And if I don't want that to be the case, I need them to waive their moral rights. Say, so look, I'm paying you a large amount of money for this thing. I don't want to. I, mean, I don't want to pack it with your name. But you may explicitly need them to waive that right. Um, <clears throat> again, we talked a little bit about this before. Uses of the licensed works. Once you identify what the works are, how can they be used? And that should be explicit within the agreement. It could be the format. Like I said, it's it's an ebook. It's a printed book. It could be that attribution is, is required, attribution is not required. You know, think about all those uses on the front end of what you want to give and bake that into the agreement with, your, with the other party. Um, if you're the copyright owner, oftentimes you'll say, you know, I am going to register this and you have to apply the notice on all your, all your works. I want you to apply the copyright notice. And why does that matter as we talked about before? Well, that matters is when it comes to damages. If you put people on notice, you can go back further and get damages for a longer period of time. So you may want to require them to do certain things with respect to their uses, like mark, uh, like putting on copyright notices, similar to why we require patent notices and a patent license. Um, we talked about this already, you know, we want them to acknowledge that if I'm the licensor, I want my license to acknowledge by contract that I own the work. So they contractually agree that this work is something that I own. And again, think about who owns those modification and derivative works and be explicit in the agreement who's going to own those. Um, if they've got certain uh, minimum advertising promotional commitments or sales requirements, like a minimum annual royalty, you're going to pay me a 5% royalty of every textbook that you sell. But if you want to maintain the license, I expect you're going to give me at least $30,000 worth of revenue in royalties. The otherwise, look, for instance, if I give you exclusive publishing right, my exclusive publishing rights my text for the life of the copyright, now think about how long copyrights are. That could be that could be you know, over hundred years for the copyright. You have the exclusive rights and you're gonna pay me five percent royalty. What happens if they don't sell any books? They stop selling. I mean, well, I can't do anything, I can't give my exclusive rights. I can't go out, I can't give it to another publisher. I just gave you all my rights and you just decided to no longer publish. What's that going to mean to me? But if it's not exclusive, there's really nothing you can do, right? If they're not exclusive, they're not, but sometimes you're not exclusive, you can say it. Not exclusive, sometimes you have to think about the cost benefit analysis because it's an opportunity. Let's say I give somebody else a non exclusive publisher rights that goes on forever and they don't have any obligation. So they're not selling, no big deal. I can go out and I can find another publisher. Or if that publisher says, well, I want to be the exclusive publisher. You can't give them exclusivity because you gave somebody else that exclusivity for decades. So the best I can do is I can say, I'll give you not exclusive that or exclusive to everybody else other than this guy. But there's still somebody else out there who has the rights. So again, something to think about, you know, with either marketing, advertising, promotion, minimum sales requirements, minimum royalty requirements. It's very critical with copyrights, especially because they go on so long. I mean, patents go on for like maybe 20 years, but it still ends at 20 years. And things like software, the value of the copyright sunset pretty quickly because people are on the new code, the new operating system. But for a literary work, I mean, just think, you know, there's been a lot of lawsuits around that over the years. Uh, you dig it back, was it, was it owned? was the work for hire, all the old comic book creators from the 30s and 50s and their heirs with all the money that's been generated from these superhero movies. There's just been a raft of lawsuits over the years from the heirs of, you know, the Siegel family that created Superman and the, the family that created Captain America and all these other artists that did it. Like, well, actually, I didn't assign it. It was, it was a different arrangement. I want a taste of that multi-billion dollar franchise because that copyright's going to go on and on and on. It's not going to be out of public domain for quite a while. Um, again, consider issues around the infringing license work. If I'm the licensee and I've got an exclusive license, do I have the right to sue on this agreement? 
And what would that look like? Do I have to bear the cost? <clears throat> Does the licensor have to join? Do they have to assist me if I'm the licensor? Am I going to give the licensee the right to sue, or I don't want the licensee to sue, or I own the word? I want to be part of that law, so at least to authorize it and, and to say whether it's okay or not. That, that would be common for most universities. Generally speaking, do not give unfettered rights to the licensees to just go out and sue wherever they want. Usually it says, yeah, we will, it's our intention to enforce, but we have to give you permission. And if we don't want you to sue, you're not going to be able to sue. And there may or may not be remedies if that happens. But think about who has the rights to sue, how that would work, who has what rights as part of that enforcement, who pays for it, how you divvy up any money that comes in out the back end, and can the other party really drag you in the lawsuit as a joint party when you don't want to go? Be explicit about that. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this. You could charge whatever royalty structure or payment structure you want around it. It's as flexible as you want to be by contract. You know, is it a percentage of sales? Is it a flat fee every year? Is it a, you know, what sometimes which I'll see with software, is it just a one time, one lump sum payment? You know, I did that for one institution, an educational institution. They sold it to Samsung for $2 million up front. Boom, that's it. We don't want to deal with royalties. We're just going to pay you $2 million. We get the software license in perpetuity. Thank you very much. It could be as simple as that. Um, you know, think about your bit. How are you going to calculate it? How is it going to get paid? Do you want minimum annual payments? If there's going to be an ongoing stream, you're the licensor, you should have an audit right to make sure it's based on 5% of net sales, and my licensee just gives me a check saying, I sold this many units this year. Uh, how do you know? And we literally just went through this, which was just a nightmare with a faculty member out of the University of Wisconsin signed, signed, signed a bad publication agreement. And she was very upset. She's like, I don't think they're giving me the right amount of royalties. I see all these other books out there, all these other sales. I don't think I'm giving a check for that. But she signed an agreement where she had no auto rights in her contract. So she had no ability to go back to the publisher and say, you have to, I'm going to spend my money, hire an auditor to go and make sure you're paying me. She just had a right to the publisher and say, send me all your sales receipts. Well, that's fine, but they paid her based on their sales receipts. It doesn't mean it was necessarily accurate or correct. And it was, it was a rough situation, but she still said um, Again, specify when you want the payments, how they're going to be made, remedies for late payments, who's responsible for paying taxes or doing various things around the payment statements. And also, if you're the licensor, what do you want on payment statement? What you don't want is for them to just send you a check. Here's your check for this court. Well, how do you calculate it? How many sales did you have? I mean, if it's net sales, how did you calculate the net sales? What costs did you take out? So be specific on the royalty reports that you want so you can calculate and understand what's going on. Again, understand how long are you getting this copyright for? Copyrights go on for a very, very long period of time. You're under no obligation to license that something for the entire term of the copyright. You can give you a five-year license, a 10-year license. Again, it matters depending on the nature of the work that you're giving. Giving a lifetime license to software a specific version of code, it's just not worth probably much more than five, 10 years. And then the software is antiquated. I don't need a 10 year old version of Microsoft Office. It's worthless. I want the new version. So the value on a very long term license like that is not there. A lifetime license or, or for the life of the copyright to win who? Or Superman. Now that's lucrative. And you're going to get a lot of value out of that over the years. So you have to think about do I really want to give a license that long? without me knowing what's going on. And one of the odd things we didn't talk about before is why work for hire versus ownership. Copyright ownership is probably unique because under the statute, if I assigned you a work as an author, and it's not a work for hire, at least it's your employer, I can ask for my property back after a period of years by law. So I can sign the assignment agreement where I sign you all the rights. I've assigned you the rights to Winnie the Pooh as the owner. After, what's it now? Is it 40 years or? Yeah, uh, I think it's 40. 40? After 40 years, I can go back and say, no, that was the assignment. 
I am now taking my rights back. That's where all the comic lawsuits were over, which the, the companies were saying it wasn't an assignment, it was a work made for hire. You were an employee, you were hired to do it, we paid you, therefore we always owned it. There is no 40 year grant back rights. They were all raising their hands saying, no, no, we were an independent contractor. We assigned it to you, those 40 years have lapsed. You Warner Brothers need to give the heirs all the rights back to Superman. Now most of these things all get settled and they kind of, they write a check and they figure it out. So like, because Herman actually worked on this, and the yeah. way we used it was, it was really interesting, we used it as a negotiation tactic to get a better deal. So it's like, hey, we know that we you have the rights to publish this book, and that's great, but we know that our 40 years is coming up, and we could like take this back and go somewhere else. So why do you make us a sweeter deal, and let's revise the agreement? You know, so we don't do that. We'll waive those rights. So it's a way that you know, it's a mechanism to one get back the rights, or to make a better deal that you already made. Yeah, I think the last really, really big one that made the news was the Milton State. Disney wrote a big check yeah. to Milton State to prevent that from happening. To make it better. To make it better. <laughs> but I mean, the, the Superman and, and Captain America era, they also had they both Warner Brothers and Marvel had big lawsuits and both them checks to redo their deals to avoid that assignment back. That's a really good thing, but the rest of the movie will go public recently and that's why they wanted to make a movie for war movie. Yeah, the, the original the original work did and again this this gets into the regular work. So for instance, as the Arthur Conan Doyle books came in, each work, each derivative work itself, even though there's multiple say there's multiple Sherlock Holmes book, certain characters were in a publication before 1927, other characters were after that date. So even though it's Joel Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, it's only for those works that were actually published. If they introduce new characters after that date, those characters are still copyrighted. So some early the versions of Winnie the Pooh are out there. That doesn't mean all the Winnie the Pooh characters are in the public domain. You have to look at the very specific work and how it works. Uh, termination, you can talk about how it terminates. If you breach, I got the right, you don't pay me my royalty, I can terminate the agreement. You do something on toward I don't like, you violate some other thing, I can terminate the agreement. You go bankrupt, I don't want your, this license to go into a bankrupt um, uh, trustee and some new company. If it goes bankrupt, I can terminate your, your license. Um, so think about kind of what you want for termination, failure to pay royalties, breaching, working outside the scope, you know, again, change of control, or you just want, do, do either party just want the right to terminate for convenience? That's somewhat unusual, because usually if someone's negotiating for a license and they are gonna put resources in developing something, they want the other party just to say, yeah, no, I want to terminate, at least on the licensor side. It's fairly common on some things if I'm the licensee to say, look, if I don't want it anymore, I can just walk away from the term. I can't use it anymore, I'll lose the license. But maybe you want the right to terminate and usually, if you're the licensee, that's something I would always want to push for, which is you don't know what your plans are going to be. You know, you should have, you, you don't want to be locked into a decade long agreement as a licensee. You don't want to use the work and deal with all the other provisions you have to deal with. You should be able to terminate them all the way. Um, you should address what happens upon expiration or termination. Um, you know, okay, so I'm the licensee, I just lost the license. Let's say I breached, or the agreement just came to an end, and I lost the license. What does that mean? Well, it means maybe I don't have the license to make new works. What if I got a warehouse full of textbooks? What do I do with those? Well, I can't distribute them anymore. I don't have the license. Unless I have a provision in the agreement that says, you know what? We understand if we have to terminate the agreement, that's fine. If you've got books that are already printed, we'll give you six months to sell them off. You have to have to pay us the royalty, but we'll have a sell-off period after the license. So you can sell off your stock, or things that are already in production, for instance. Or does it truly just end when it ends? So think through the various scenarios. Okay, if I lost this license, what would that mean? Is both the licensor and the licensee. And how do we want that to hand, be handled? Uh, again, some of the provisions you'll see in the license agreement, you can see in a lot of standard business agreements. There'll be a confidentiality provision, especially around your royalty reports both ways, you want to keep that confidential. There's going to be standard reps and warranties. You know, if you're the licensee, you're going to want to rep and warranty the licensor owns the work, that they're authorized to do this, that the work doesn't infringe 
somebody else's rights to the extent that they can do that, that you're getting the works in the, in the media that you want. If it's software, I want to make sure you may ask for rep warranty if there's no open source in it. There's no malicious code or harmful code. Um, if you're the licensor, you want the licensee to rep warrant that they're going to comply with the laws, um, that they're going to take certain efforts, again, to exploit the work and, and generate revenue around the work, and that they're going to get all the permissions that they need. Um, if they're going to make modifications, you may ask for rep warranty, they're not going to make modifications and incorporate infringing third party material. It's got to be their own modifications for their own people. Especially if you want to own them, if you are a licensor and you want to own the derivative works. Well, I want to make sure that the only person creating things is the person that's signing that agreement. So if I want to own the derivative works, I want to make sure it's the licensee has all the rights to give me the rights to own the derivative works. So for instance, if I license you my software rights and I say I own all the derivative works, I want to wrap and warranty that if you, my licensee, go out and hire a third party software, Contractor, that you're making sure that they've got to assign the rights to them so they can assign the rights to me. So think about that not only having that obligation, but putting that in the reps and warranty section. Uh, indemnification uh, really is making somebody whole. So find the licensee, and let's say I license the software from Jeff Peterson. I give you a license to my software. You go out tomorrow and you start selling it under my license, and Microsoft sues you. And they say, actually, Jeff really didn't know that. I've got a patent that covers that. So I'm going to sue you for using Jeff's software. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I just paid Jeff a whole bunch of money for that license for that software. He should make me whole. Well, absent something in the contract that says that's the case, I have no obligation to make you whole. You want that? That's your identification clause. Licensee, look, you licensed are going to identify me. You're going to defend me identify me and make me whole if certain things happen, like the work infringes, or you breach one of those reps and warranties that you just made. Same thing with the licensor. Your licensee's out there doing certain things, all of a sudden I get brought into a lawsuit, not because of my actions, but because the licensee made modifications to my software. And nothing you would mean that they made the modifications, not I made a lawsuit. They want the same thing from the licensee. So think about how the actions of the other party potentially cause you harm around this arrangement, and think about how you may want to have an indemnification clause that deals with that. Um, if you've got indemnification, you may want insurance, because you can't get blood from a stone. So that's great. I've got an indemnification clause. They're going to make me, they're going to make me whole. It turns out they have no money to make me whole. So then what happens? Well, then I guess I just have this contract here that Jeff's got to step in and help me out. Jeff says, eh, I don't need money, sorry. You may want to agree, but well, you have to have a certain amount of insurance that covers this activity to backstop the obligation that you just made. And I want to see that insurance before I sign this contract and understand the scope of that insurance. So that's really kind of part of kind of making sure that they can meet their damage and the identification of other obligations too. Um, again, if you want specific types of breach, you may want to, the remedies for specific types of breach, you may want to state that in that contract, for instance, Equitable remedies. Normally, if you go to a court, you've got to show that you have a need for an equitable remedy. The fall for most most courts are damages. Oh, you know, I can give you the right to check, but if you want the court to actually issue an injunction, that's a harder remedy to get. It's more helpful if you have a contract where the other party agrees that if I do certain things, you're entitled to an equitable remedy. You can show that to the courts that they agree that they agree this is an appropriate remedy for this type of breach. You know, they violate my confidentiality. They agree that I can get an injunction to stop me from violating that confidentiality. They can get me a, an injunction that agrees that I can stop them from distributing this. It's not just damages from distribution. They agree I can actually stop them. You always have the right to ask for the equitable remedy, even if you don't ask for it in the contract. It's just harder to get. You want them to agree to it in the contract that you have the right for the equitable remedy. Or if you want liquidated damages, saying, how do I calculate what the damages would be? If they did this activity, I have to bring damages experts, I gotta figure this out, or do I just wanna agree by contract? Look, if you sell it outside of this jurisdiction, you're gonna write me a check for $50,000, period. We're agreed by contract, that's the damage. I don't have to say how much I was armed, I don't have to prove how many was sold, we're just gonna agree on a specific liquidated damages. If you do this, you owe me X. 
Uh, again, we talked about this earlier, assignment and change of control. Think through what if my partner on the other side wants to assign this to somebody else. Is that okay? Is that not okay? And if it is okay, then they need my permission. And how do we want to craft that? Maybe it's I get the right to approve and I won't unreasonably withhold it. Or it's not only an assignment, but a change of control. We have to think through that as well. So let's say I license it to you, a piece of software, to your new company. So Bob Software, LLC. And it turns out, well, I'm not going to sell the assets of Bob's LLC. Someone's simply just going to buy Bob's Software, LLC. There's just a new owner of Bob's Software, LLC. Well, my contract is with Bob's Software, LLC. There's been no assignment of that contract. Bob's Software, LLC is still over there. But you're not involved with anyone. There's a brand new owner. So if you don't want that to happen, you don't want there to be a change of control without your permission, you have to, you have to explicitly state that as well. So it's not just the assignment, it's assignment and change of control. And then various other issues such as what's the governing law? If we're going to have to dispute what court are we going to be in? Are we going to be in courts in Wisconsin or are you going to drag me to Singapore? And now I'm dealing with a case in Singapore and I don't want to deal with that. So think about those issues. Do we want to be in the court system or do we want to agree that we're going to have mediation? or arbitration instead. Um, and then sort of standards for boilerplate agreements. Um, we kind of talked about all these issues here, so we're already way over, so I'm gonna just let that go by the wayside. They'll be on the slides. I'm sorry this went so long, guys, which is a lot of material. Today, so Super I hope it was helpful. <laughs>